Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, up next, we have um, Melissa and Aaliyah with Infront Compliance. Uh, so I'll turn it over to the both of you. Excellent. Welcome. Um, welcome. Well, welcome everybody back from the break. And this is Melissa Koch and Aaliyah Loria. We're here to talk to you um, about not just another pretty interface and the importance of selecting systems that include expert content when you're determining which cybersecurity tools you want to use in in the practice of of your your lines of business or in the practice of securing your your cybersecurity environment to meet CMMC requirements. So briefly, if we could uh, change slides. Next slide. So briefly, um, before we get to the short quiz, I'll just tell you a little bit about who we are and, and why it is that, that we're talking to you about this. So I'm Melissa, I'm the CEO of Infront. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade, as is my co-founder, Aaliyah, and we specialize in compliance. And we specialize in compliance in, in very hairy areas, so highly regulated industries uh, with difficult to understand and difficult to apply types of concepts. And we've spent our careers trying to work with clients and explain to them what these regulations mean, why they're important, and how they apply to their business. So the first, the first thing that we like to kind of start with here is when you are incentivi incentivizing organizations to do the right thing, particularly here when you're rolling out a, a new framework, do you A, make things harder to understand and navigate, or B, make things easier to understand and navigate? And um, next slide. Easier. <laughs> so we have found in, in our career, and, and we, again, spend a lot of time caring about this subject and, and putting a lot of effort into making our platform um, really, really focus on this particular concept, which is when you want to incentivize organizations to do the right thing, particularly where there is behavior change, you want to make it as easy as possible for them to understand and navigate, particularly when, um, when it's as critical as, as cybersecurity is. Um, next slide, please. So what does this mean in the context of CMMC in particular? So CMMC, um, from, from our perspective, if we had to really boil it down, it's a response to inadequate cybersecurity across the defense industrial base. It's a way for, for the entirety of the constituents to mature into a framework that can create actual, auditable, and sustainable change. And here, we all know what the risks are if we don't have these requirements in place, and we, we all know how important it is for the DOD to have in place. So this is what we would characterize as a new approach that's designed to reduce risk, lower costs, and increase transparency, which means it requires new tools to make the requirements understandable and accessible for the DIB. Next slide, please. So when we talk about tools for the job or new tools for the job, we, we specifically focus on usability beyond just the interface because there are systems out there that are, are lovely to look at, um, but when you get in them, they really, they really can fall short of giving you the, the, the flexibility, the transparency, and the efficiency that, that you need. And that's where expert content comes in. So when we look at what the requirements are under CMMC and we talk about the importance of expert content in these tools, the idea here is to make sure that the expert content can bring that understandability, transparency, and efficiency to the assessment and compliance management process. Specifically, we're talking about plain language, which means translating the requirements into plain language. And what we mean by that is, is making sure it's understandable by the person responding to the assessment questions. And what that does is it raises the overall confidence level in the, res in the response set that you're getting back. Dynamically driven, and what we mean by that is, is having a, a logic feature in the background, again, for, for the user, if you're the user in the driver's seat who is responding to, to these assessments or responding on behalf of an organization to these assessments, answering what you need. So if you were to respond negatively to a question, you, you wouldn't get any additional questions related to that anymore. And the idea there is to really streamline the process and make sure you don't have fatigue, which again, helps helps in the overall confidence level then, that, you, that you get back by way of response set. 
there's built in tools and guidance in these types of platforms that, that again, we, we spend a lot of time around to make sure that, you know, for terms that are terms of art um, and phrases that are terms of art, that there's ways to get an explanation as to what that means from within the tool. Um, additionally, being able to link out and get other guidance while you're in it. So you don't have to click in and out of systems to try and find all of the information that you need to give a, a complete and accurate response. And then having easy to read reports, which makes the response set digestible for those of us who have to interpret it and figure out where the gaps are and more importantly, close them. Next slide, please. I'll hand it over to my colleague Alia, who will so so talk about this in a, a little more detail. Right. So um, I'm Alia Luria. I am um, Melissa's CTO and co-founder, and um, from and I am also an attorney, by the way. And we spend a lot of time thinking about these compliance matters in in a way that to drive um, the pr in practice what we just talked about uh, as far as like what you what the wish list for an expert system is. And so, you know, when you take highly regulated or highly complex matters and you distill them um, in a way that, you know, anybody can do their taxes, that's an expert system. Anybody can um, go through and an, an, an complete a wizard and that's an expert system. But what does that mean for, for the, the Dibbin, for, you know, the, the um, practice of that? Well, when we take plain language, we are basically saying, okay, you as a as a practicer, you you're either an IT security person, maybe you're a consultant, or maybe you're one of the co the the contractors or vendors for within the, the DIB, and you need to be able to respond to these questions, and you all need to be on the same page. And so that means for us, looking at systems that allow the that content to be translated from a regulatory control um, into something that can be understood by the person who has to to respond. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, the per the person is, for instance, somebody you just pulled off the street and asked them a question. It's it's the person who, within the scope of their job, most likely has to deal with this information. So when I, for instance, my example here is the implementation of the principles of least privilege. Obviously, the average American or international person is not going to know necessarily what the the principle of least privilege is, but there is the ability for that for that topic to be known to the individuals who may be responding to this question. So the business side of that means, okay, I need to know what this means and I need to be able to respond to it. And that means, um, you know, putting every request on text of who has to respond and why and giving them the questions in a way that they can actually answer uh, and get meaningful response rather than either open-ended, vague, or confusing. And so that's what we mean when, when we say plain language. So next slide. Um, and when we talk about tooltips, you can see here that I actually have a tooltip popped up on that. And, and again, we talk about the principle of, least, principle of least privilege here because it is a term of art. And so having the ability to define that within with respect to the particular regulation or the particular um, area that you want to focus on, whether that if that's CMMC or if that's another another NIST protocol, or whether it's even something outside of the the DIB uh, specific regulations, you want to make sure that everybody responding to each and every request and is on the same page. So if you're a consultant and you're attempting to get to an answer um, with a client, you know, being able to say, okay, you may have heard of le principle of least privilege, but this is this specific meaning within. CMMC that you're going to need to think about with with respect to how you're implementing it. And that comes up over and over again, because all of these regulations have their own nuances. And so for us, the idea is to provide as much guidance and, and, and tool tips and content into that. And I think when you're looking for a system and a tool to rely on to help you gather this information and collate it into something usable, either as a consultant for, or for directly for your business, you know, you're looking for people to provide you with specific information in a format that you can access quickly within a system so that you're not hunting through Google and looking for the best, you know, reasonable response. Um, and then also to be able to link directly from within the system to any any um, content that comes up. And, and we're that's going to be particularly important as additional guides are released, um, as, you know, for instance, the assessment guides come out as as the various controls have been um, safe harbors start to come into play, those kinds of things. I think you'll see tooltips um, in this area become even more important because people will really need to be able to access 
kind of the, the, the state of the state, the precedent, what's what is um, been found to be either required or not allowed uh, as part of these responses. So next slide. And so another area when we look, talk about dynamic logic and Melissa did touch on this quite a bit in the in the kind of the introductory area is the idea that you should be able to display content that's responsive to prior content. And so um, that might mean, you know, again, hiding a series of, of responses that may not be required based on how your um, your particular uh, navigation through the system works, such as if you are if there's a non applicable portion, which with maybe with CMMC is still up for debate whether any portion would ever be non applicable and and that's a whole nother conversation which i'm sure we'll dig into later but the idea being that to the extent that you can call information that's not necessary to respond we the expert system can help you do that in a way that again reduces that fatigue and keeps the individuals who have to respond um from kind of just throwing up their hands and rolling their eyes back in their head and screaming um, and that's kind of how what what one of the goals with an expert system is. So it should it sh the idea is where where an expert system is in play, it should be able to get you through a system or, or a process with the least number of questions. And there's a lot of ways in which this can be um, dealt with, particularly like for instance, just in the TurboTax Wizard kind of way. But there's also going to be you know I think a great a possibility for enhancement down the line with this where you're deduplicating where you're getting the ability to um, manage question sets on a on a fully dynamic nature and that's i think something that as providers we're super excited about the future of, of the possibility here um, and that i think when you have an expert system that's committed to really making that process streamlined and improving the quality of life for the people that have to respond and um, work either work with clients or deal with this information for themselves. When you have someone who's really very committed to that, I think you can see that there'll be some really interesting um, things that are able to happen as far as the ability to, you know, in include inheritance, the ability to do deduplication, and those kinds of things. And, and an expert system committed to that is going to be something that is worth um, working with and investing because you're going to reap like an economies of scale and benefits down the line. So. Um, next slide. Okay, and of course, uh, on the output reporting, easy to read reports will help with that digestion, digestible data that you're receiving on the back end. Um, and I think we are all we've all had a lot of discussion over the course of the past, you know, nine months, ten months about what is going to be the output. How are we going to be handling this? How are assessors going to be dealing with CMMC specifically? And and for us, um, you know, our goal at the first iteration of every of an expert system is to get so that the information is provided in a clean and easy to view way where you can see the overview quickly you can dig into the sections quickly and then you can get to the details and there are everything's organized date time stamped artifacts collected etc in an easy way and then from there there's a springboard okay and that i think is the next step of for how expert systems will be able to manage cmmc data I mean, exporting directly into certain formats, such as EMAS format or OSP formats for particular list um, assessments. Does that mean um, allowing it to just be output into an Excel? Does it mean connecting through API? All of those are things that I think are important for an expert system to be able to deal with. Um, but for from the very beginning, you at least want the data managed and collated in a way that you can get to your responses quickly, particularly if you're a readiness consultant or if you're a business who's trying to close gaps. And that means the quicker I know what's going on, the, the quicker I can actually close those gaps and get myself ready for my assessor to come in and do the assessment. And so that those are basically some of the, I mean, there are myriad possibilities that exist within an expert system to make it a clear choice for how you manage your, um, you know, CMMC data, how you manage the process. But those were four that we felt were really important um, when particularly when you're thinking of tools and we've highlighted our tool here, but we urge you that if there's a better tool, you know, pick the tool that has these features, pick the tool that allows you to accomplish um, the goals of these expert systems so so that you can reduce that amount of time and energy that you know and suffering that goes into this process so um next slide 
Okay. Um, so Melissa might just handle some takeaways and I might, if I have any final thoughts, I'll add them in. Absolutely. So, so Aaliyah, I think did an excellent job of, it, of kind of painting a picture of what expert content looks like in real life and how it can really help move the needle as, as we all start on our CMMC journeys and we all have incredibly important roles to play in that. And the big takeaways that we want to emphasize here is, is again, this is this is a new framework. And because it's a new framework, it needs a new tool for the job to be able to meet the cybersecurity needs of the div and make sure that everybody um, is participating in a way that that is compliant with the level that that they're operating under. Which means selecting tools that include expert content is key to making the process of getting and staying CMMC compliant, efficient, and cost effective. Again, there are a number of tools out there in the marketplace and making sure that that you choose tools that support you, um, whether you are working on coming to compliant for your own personal organization or if you're a third party assisting with readiness or if you're an auditor, choosing your tools uh, or assessor, your tools really matter. Um, and again, we each have a critical role to play in protecting our nation supply chain and the tools that we choose at this stage of the game and the tools that mature with us as as we go along with the CMMC journey is, is going to make a huge difference in our effectivity and in cybersecurity for this very, very critical sector. And I think I, my as a final thought, because I know we do have a couple minutes left, I will just add that um, that there's a lot of upheaval that's gone on this year, and we all know we've all been living with that pretty regularly. And I think just to, to add to that, to what Melissa said, the flexibility and the ability to have a partner who's willing to work with you to get where you need to go, I think it's it's what we're going to kind of consider more and more important as we start selecting tools. And I do think that um, the 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 kind of the group that's that's presented today and the the wealth of knowledge that is incorporated in this uh, webinar really does show you that there's so many moving parts and pieces to this entire process and to um, to compliance specifically related around CMMC the interim you know requirements and rules whether or not 171 is applicable on what level and all of that. So there's so many moving pieces. So where you can create efficiency for yourselves and, and kind of reduce the hair tearing and you know the, the, the questions of what do I do? How do I deal with this? And be able to put a, a process together around, okay, you know, what, how am I going to make myself compliant? And how is that going to look not only through the end of this year, next year and the year after, knowing that we're moving into an era of real uncertainty about a three year, you know, audit cycle that we're moving into uncertainty regarding um, how often you're going to get, you know, spot checks or whether or not you're coming up for contract during, you know, while other people are still waiting. There's so much uncertainty. So really just thinking through how you can take some of that burden away from yourselves. That's what our goal here for, for, for this presentation it was. And to understand that there are tools out there that are that where the content is there to help you as much as it can and that the people who who are part of that are there as a resource to really help you um, with this process and this journey. So um, with that, I, I really thank you guys for taking the time to listen and, um, and we hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa and Aaliyah. I'm gonna turn everything over now to Ryan Heidorn with Steel Root. Thank you, Tim. Hi everyone, happy Halloween from which city? Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, we're based in Salem and when you live here, Halloween is definitely the biggest holiday of the year. Uh, it's also snowing right now, so that's fun. Um, the theme of my presentation is tricks and treats working with an MSP for CMMC readiness. My name's Ryan, I'm a managing partner at Steel Root. We're a cybersecurity services company that's focused on the defense industrial base. So. We are a managed services provider helping contractors implement security practices and prepare for CMMC. Um, my agenda for today, 20 action-packed minutes of talking about using an MSP to prepare for CMMC. I'm gonna start by differentiating what the DOD thinks an MSP is versus what most of us think it is. I'm gonna share five tricks and five treats of working with an MSP for CMMC compliance. I'll go through everyone's favorite question, does my MSP need to be CMMC certified? 
um, in providing a non answer for you there. Uh, some questions to ask your MSP to vet their readiness to support your compliance journey. And finally, we'll get honest with ourselves and talk about cost realism. One of my favorite topics, what to expect to spend on CMMC. Next slide, please. So I think many of us know this, most of the defense industrial base is made of small businesses. If you're attending today and you work at one of the big Beltway Bandits, this might not be the most relevant session for you, unless you're outsourcing IT or security services. But small businesses typically don't have a lot of internal IT resources. They're likely to have no dedicated cybersecurity resources internally. And uh, they are likely to have kicked the can down the road with technology and security compliance requirements for a long time, creating a lot of technical debt. Uh, I think many of us intuitively understand that, especially those of us who have worked in IT or security or compliance uh, at a smaller or mid-sized DOD contractor, but just setting the table in terms of, of where we are today. Next slide. So I have come to understand that when the DOD talks about MSPs or managed services providers, they seem to be talking about something very different from what I think of as an MSP. They often seem to be thinking of giant service providers like Microsoft or AWS, companies that are providing platform as a service or infrastructure as a service or SaaS. And these cloud service providers definitely play a critical role in compliance for small businesses. But if the contractor, if it's a small business and they don't have strong internal IT and cybersecurity competencies, they're likely going to need a partner to help them properly configure, integrate, adopt, and manage cloud services. So for our purposes today, when I talk about MSPs and MSSPs, which I'll define in a second, I'm talking about small and mid-sized organizations that are providing managed or outsourced IT or security services to other small and mid-sized organizations. Uh, in many cases, the, the client organization is leaning very heavily on the MSP for their day-to-day -day IT and security needs and for strategic guidance on security and compliance, which uh, is why, in my view, the success of CMMC implementation across the defense industrial base really depends heavily on the effectiveness of MSPs who are supporting those organizations in the DIB. Next slide. All right, five treats of working with an MSP or an MSSP. Uh, just so everyone's aware, MSSP is Managed Security Services Provider. Uh, there is a, a, a thin and blurring line between what differentiates an MSP and an MSSP. A lot of traditional MSPs are, are thought of as uh, IT infrastructure folks, help desk folks, whereas the MSSPs are providing more targeted security services, things like uh, SIM as a service, managed security operations center, those sorts of things. We're definitely seeing in the market a uh, shift or rebranding of MSPs who now call themselves MSSPs. Um, I, in my experience, maybe not all of them have earned that extra S in their title, but that's probably a different conversation. But here are five reasons why you would want to work with a, an outsourced IT or security provider to help you prepare for CMMC. Um, the first one's cost, right? So everyone wants to talk about cost. Let's start with the skills required to implement and prepare for CMMC. I alluded to this already, but Remember, CMMC is a people and process requirement just as much as it is a technology requirement. Tools alone are not going to solve the problem. They're not going to uh, make you pass an assessment. Um, so when we think about skills, we looked at NIST's NICE framework, which defines different roles uh, in technology based on knowledge, skills, and abilities. And we boiled it down to a minimum of four full-time job roles across IT and security and compliance to implement and manage a DFAR 7012 compliant IT infrastructure. Um, in those four different roles, you know, at, at a small organization, first of all, they're, they're unlikely to have uh, all of these roles or even any of them. These different roles might be filled by some of the same uh, individuals. But basically, if we're just looking for a benchmark on what do these skills cost, uh, looking at the NICE framework, we find that these four roles carry an associated annual salary cost of 325 to 450,000. 
Um, I definitely know that would be on the higher end where I live in Massachusetts, if you can even fill those positions in the market. So one of the, the values, and, and this kind of goes with number three here, is that working with an MSP gives you access to a team of, of skilled professionals, often at less of a cost than uh, hiring one single person internally, which is why it's such an attractive option for so many uh, organizations within the, the defense industrial base. That, of course, comes with a lot of trade-offs, and I advise most companies that I'm working with that if they can, they should have some form of internal IT resource, even if they're working with an MSP. But I'm going to go into more detail on expected costs at the end of my presentation. So the next thing I want to focus on as an advantage of working with an MSP is the reduced time to standing up new cybersecurity capabilities. Uh, many of us here are working at organizations where leadership has a renewed sense of urgency to prepare for CMMC. Uh, we've seen with the, the interim final rule, just uh, uh, suddenly so many people are interested in doing a self-assessment and getting their score into SPRS. So anyways, an organization can go out and they can buy tools, right? You can get a SIM, you can get EDR, you can get application allow listing, all of these great security products in the market that you need that align with CMMC practices. But working with an MSP can help you operationalize these tools and start to build that demonstrable process maturity much faster than you can learn and deploy them yourselves in some cases. So that's where leveraging the expertise and experience of a qualified MSP can really accelerate your time to adopt some of these security practices that you may not already have in place. Um, down with four and five, this is an interesting conversation that we could probably spend a whole session talking about, but one of the key reasons you may want to work with a partner who gets it is this probability that you can inherit some security practices and processes from your service provider. Things that they're doing for you, things that they're doing on your behalf, or security and management practices that are kind of built in to the services that you subscribe to. We're still awaiting guidance on this in terms of the CMMC model and how it will be assessed, but there are multiple models for this that already exist uh, within federal cybersecurity frameworks. And I, I fully expect that CMMC assessors will eventually have a methodology for considering security practices that an organization inherits from an MSP or cloud service provider. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here's, the, here's the other side of things, right? Um, for better or worse, when you're working with an MSP, it's a, a pretty intimate relationship, right? Most of the time they've got administrative access into your environment. Uh, they've got the keys to the kingdom as it were, and they are uh, doing a lot of these administrative tasks for you on highly sensitive information and sometimes. So uh, you're inheriting their maturity or their immaturity. Um, all too often, we have kind of this, you know, classic case of, of the, the cobbler's children who wear no shoes, where an MSP might be uh, ready to sell you a security solution that perhaps they haven't implemented internally or maybe haven't implemented in a mature way internally. Uh, so you've got to be careful that the organization that's providing security services for you is themselves secure, kind of a, a case of who watches the watchmen, right? And we see example after example of MSPs being specifically targeted by adversaries and cyber criminals because MSPs typically have remote admin access to all their customers. So you breach one MSP and perhaps you can spread ransomware to all of their clients at once. Just this year, the FBI, the Secret Service, and basically every security research firm have been sounding the alarm about this attack vector. Again, this is a topic that we could rabbit hole on, but the, the point is make sure your MSP knows what they're doing with their own security practices and operational maturity. Third bullet, um, <laughs> RMM or remote monitoring and management is something that, that I like to get fired up about. So I'll, I'll dish my hottest takes here on, on this webinar today. The traditional MSP model is to deploy remote administrative uh, software um, to make actions across their entire customer base. This is how they achieve economies of scale and why hiring an MSP is less expensive than hiring internal resources. 
but it's also fundamentally problematic, both in light of that increased attack surface we just talked about, and also with respect to some CMMC practices. Uh, things as detailed as, you know, almost none of these platforms use FIPS validated cryptography for their remote control sessions, but also because, in my opinion, these MSP ecosystems encourage bad behavior from MSPs who might choose a solution because it integrates with their stack and is easy to manage as to, opposed to whether it's the best solution. Um, I'm personally of the opinion that these traditional MSP tools need to die or evolve to rise to the occasion of modern security and compliance challenges. Um, but just one thing to be thinking about if you're going to be partnering with an MSP, what type of access will they have into your environment and what risks might that pose to you? If you're working with an MSP and you have CMMC requirements or anticipate them, I'm gonna share in a moment a few questions you can ask to gauge their readiness to support you. Uh, many MSPs are still coming up to speed on CMMC and don't have the broader context of defense contracting and federal cybersecurity standards. Because your CMMC assessment is pass fail, you probably wanna minimize your MSPs on the job training. And lastly, there's no silver bullet here. Ultimately, you own all of your compliance requirements. You own the most risk in the relationship. So don't expect to hire an MSP and your CMMC problem goes away. Next slide. Question that people have been asking since the CMMC rollout was announced, knowing that so many contractors in the DIB use MSPs, this has been a top question, will MSPs need to be CMMC certified? I've cited a couple quotes here uh, with some very intuitive responses. Uh, Wayne will probably kill me for including his photo here, but I really like his quote and fully agree with the logic. If an MSP is hosting systems for you that contain CUI, absolutely, they will need to be CMMC certified. But there's a big but, and if we go to the next slide, if you read the DFARS clauses and look at the CMMC model, it's all applicable to systems that process, store, or transmit CUI. But what about access? Many folks would argue that if an MSP does not process, store, or transmit CUI, but merely has access to environments that contain it, MSP does not need to be CMMC certified. Seems like a bit of a loophole to me and something I hope that the CMMC program will address as we move forward. But as of today, we don't have official guidance on whether or not MSPs themselves will need to be CM CMMC certified if they support defense contractors. What we really need is additional guidance on the definition of a covered contractor information system, which we see defined here. I think an attorney could probably argue either side of whether or not uh, the way MSPs support their clients fall under this definition. Uh, so my answer to this question, do MSPs need to be CMMC certified is maybe not, but if I were a contractor, I'd probably feel better if they were. So again, the situation we're in today where no one is certified and there aren't enough qualified MSPs to go around is maybe not the right time to fight this battle, but uh, something to be thinking of as we move forward. Next slide. I have two, just two slides here and I'm starting to run out of time, so I will go through these quickly, but these are my top five questions for starting a conversation uh, with your MSP around uh, whether or not you can effectively trust them for helping you on your compliance journey. Are they preparing to receive certification themselves? If they are, that's a good uh, indicator that they're taking this seriously. Will they accept a contractual flowdown of your DFARS clauses so you can build some of this into your agreement with your MSP? If you have export control requirements, do they employ U.S. persons? And I would include in this, do they subcontract any work uh, to non-U.S. persons? Definitely something you want to be aware of. How are they going to support you during the CMMC assessment process? Are they going to provide support during the assessment to defend to the assessor the, the systems that they help you implement and manage? Uh, lastly, do the systems that they use to access and manage your environment conform to DFARS requirements themselves? including FedRAMP for the use of cloud services uh, that may be used to uh, process CUI. Next slide. So here's the big one for most businesses that I talk to. Everyone wants to know how much it's gonna cost to prepare for CMMC and what they should budget. Like Andy mentioned in the first presentation today, CMMC is a journey, right? So it's gonna look a little different for every organization and it's very hard to generalize costs. 
We do have a few data points from the federal government, one that comes to us through NIST in the commentary on special publication 800171 Bravo, which is now 800 or 172. And that estimated 250 to $500,000 to stand up a, a 25 to 50 endpoint network in an isolated environment. Uh, we have this recent regulatory impact analysis over there on the right hand of the slide, which estimates for a small entity pursuing CMMC level three, you're gonna spend about 120 grand just implementing the two new practices and three process maturity requirements that are in addition to 800171, which of course they assume you have already fully implemented. Um, but I'm often asked to create proposals that show an all in cost for compliance, assuming a CMMC maturity level of, of level three. Not only is this an impossible task, it also misses the fundamental mindset shift that cybersecurity is not a project. It is an ongoing capability that's going to take time and ongoing effort to mature at your company. But everyone wants numbers, so here's what I say. We say you are looking at 200 to 500 hours of labor minimum, um, hands-on planning, configuration, deployment, implementation, process development, documentation, that range uh, may be underscoped for complex environment, but if you're a small business, I feel fairly comfortable with that range, depending on how much work you've done to date. And then you may have hardware purchases, right? So say example, if for example, your existing firewall or VPN appliance doesn't support PIPs validated cryptography, you may have software purchases. For example, if you don't already have a, a vulnerability scanning or log collection capability, and the assessment and certification process is also going to cost you money at some point. But the biggest takeaway for business leaders out there is that there are going to be ongoing costs for the proper care and feeding of your cybersecurity and compliance programs. You're never really done with it either. Um, like Andy mentioned in the beginning, you probably need to get used to that fact. You're working in defense or national security. Cybersecurity is a critical business capability. So if you've been tasked with CMMC and your company and you're fighting for budget, uh, as Ryan Bonner likes to say, go find whoever owns risk in your company and make sure they understand that you're not going to be successful without this mindset change. Um, I like this analogy that compliance is like a baby. Your responsibilities don't end when you have the baby. In fact, they're just beginning. So you set up the nursery and everything the baby needs in your house, um, but that's just the beginning. You don't ever stop being a parent with the responsibilities. And just like you'd closely vet and probably do a background check on a caregiver before trusting them with your kid, you need to make sure that you're fully comfortable and confident in the abilities and experience of your MSP before partnering together to build your company's cybersecurity maturity. So I hope some of this was helpful to you all. Thank you so much for sticking around today and thanks to all the other presenters for all the great content. Tim, I will kick it back to you. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. All right, next we're gonna turn it over to Nick from DGC. Thank you, Tim. Hi, everybody. My name is Nick Delina. I'm a principal at DGC, one of the largest regional accounting tax and business advisory firms in the Northeast. We're headquartered in Massachusetts, where it's snowing, as Ryan mentioned. Uh, I lead the risk, uh, the IT risk assurance and advisory practice at DGC. I'm also on the board of directors at the NDIA New England chapter. Uh, and we are at DGC, we're an applicant CMMC uh, C3PAO. I come from an audit and compliance background, and I've been doing this long enough that my first audit was part of Y2K compliance. So kids, ask your parents what that was. Next slide, please. All right, so I didn't want to be the only one without a meme here, so I, I put this together and I thought we could all just look in the mirror and, and cry for a little bit. Uh, this, this is, you know, a, a obviously coming from uh, reading the interim rule, uh, a lot of us were surprised with what's in there, but you know, I still speak to folks on a regular basis who have been subject to 7012 for so long and really haven't taken any action. And, you know, now that the CMMC being on the horizon was was a stressor, obviously, but now seeing the new DFARS clauses, uh, which I'll touch on briefly, but I know Wayne is uh, coming up after me and he's going to go on a deep dive, but that really could be some bad news for folks who are well behind on their on their programs. But I just look for any excuse to use the Vince McMahon meme. 
Next slide, please. So some assumptions I'm, I'm going to make here in, in my session uh, is to assume that you're subject to 7012, I mean, I think you wouldn't be here if you weren't, and that you're making good or decent progress in your obligations to implement 800-171. And you've looked at CMMC level three and you understand the deltas and you're maybe you're tracking, uh, you're tracking those, you've POAM them. Uh, and you're on track maybe to have zero CMMC level three poems next year or 2022, you know, you're, but you're, I'm assuming you're, you're on track. You're, you're putting a good amount of effort in. Next slide. And so my goal for this session is really to talk about, uh, so the interim rule in my mind shifted things around priority wise and in putting this deck together, it forced me to change things up. So my first goal is to stress the importance of the rule. And, and I strongly suggest that you read it and digest its implications for your near term business objectives and uh, having a look at what that, uh, what that may mean for future solicitations. The second goal, of course, is, is to, to talk about three pitfalls that your compliance program might experience between now and certification. So again, going back to what I was assuming, you know, if you're here, you're making good progress on your 7012 obligations, you've looked at the deltas to CMMC level three. I'm, you know, I'm assuming you're on track to maybe be ready for certification next year or the year after. There's so much involved, as I don't need to tell you, in getting to compliance that it's easy to get to a point where, you know, you may be, you may think you're ready, but it's been a couple of years since you've looked at uh, some of the aspects of your program. So I want to cover a couple of ways that your compliance program could sort of fall off the tracks, even though it looks like you're closing poems out. Next slide, please. Okay, the first one, and this obviously was a, a change that I had to make to what I was originally thinking for this when the, the interim rule dropped uh, a few weeks ago. So the, you know, you, you're probably noticing a theme with what I'm mentioning around the interim rule. Um, as I mentioned, Wayne's coming up next with a deep dive, so I'm not going to duplicate effort here, but at a high level, the rule, which goes into effect November 30th, so really a month from today, uh, in my opinion, it majorly changes up the priorities of what folks should be working on. In short, there are two new clauses that pertain to and extend 7012. Those are 7019 and 7020. Basically, if you're subject to 7012 today, which I assume most of you are, you may see 7019 and 7020 in solicitations, you know, possibly as soon as November 30th or December 1st. We, you know, we don't quite know. If you do and you don't have an assessment record on file in the DOD supplier performance risk management system, you won't be able to take award. Of that work. The concept might sound very familiar to you as it's how CMMC is designed, but these two new clauses basically put that same framework on top of what you're subject today with 800-171. Next slide, please. There are three types of assessments that are introduced in this rule. One is a self-assessment, a basic, they call it basic uh, self-assessment. The others are DOD-led, a medium and a high assessment. If you are thinking of getting started with the self-assessment, which I think you should be, you should know that they need to be done using the DOD's DIBCAC scoring methodology, which applies a weighted scoring overlay to 171. And as I mentioned, failure to have an assessment record on file will prevent you taking award of future work with 7019 and 7020 and there is clauses. Next slide, please. The second pitfall is uh, letting your documentation go stale. So if you've used 171A as a reference, 171 alpha as a reference for what you'll be assessed against by a C3PAO, and I hope you have, you'll see that for each security requirement, 171A generally includes a review of definitions and documentation and, and so on as part of the assessment objectives. I recommend making sure that Everything that you've done to get to compliance for each requirement, everything gets looked at at least annually and definitely before you bring in a C3PAO to do an assessment. 
Uh, in fact, depending on where your company is domiciled and who you do business with, you might have regulatory obligations outside of the CUI world that may force this to happen. So 25 states and DC require companies have various forms, but we in Massachusetts, we call it a written information security program or a WISP that's uh, reviewed and updated at least annually. And most of the clients that I have in the DIB, there's heavy overlap between their WISP and the DFARS program, just based on what they do. And uh, with a lot of them, a majority of their business is DOD focused. So they're required to review that material at least annually and update any protections that are defined within that document. So I think you definitely want to do that uh, for the material that you're building out for 7012 and for CMMC. Uh, you know, just given the, the nature of what's required to comply, you may be conducting significant system changes you know, in order to comply, you're probably implementing new systems, pulling out old ones, isolating ones that maybe you can't update, you know, out of date systems. And so the documentation requirements, which are significant, uh, will, will definitely become an issue if, you know, as time goes on. So you want to make sure you're, you're reviewing them. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, th as I mentioned, you know, the, 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 if you're using 171A, which absolutely you should be, uh, it's it seems like every single requirement has you know you're you're I mean even if it's just in the system security plan, you're being asked to define something and document something, and so you take that and multiply it across the 110 requirements. That's a pretty big effort, and you've got policy and procedure requirements, and then if you're looking towards CMMC, you've got process maturity requirements. Uh, so, so the, the documentation aspects alone, not even talking about the technical configuration and so on, it's, it's a huge lift. So this is one major area and, and I've seen it just in, in helping companies, you know, coming in today and looking at where their four plus year old compliance efforts are against 7012. It's very common to see references to physical backups when they maybe went disk to disk two years ago and haven't gone back around to update the documentation. There's tons of examples like that. So, you know, it's it's a significant effort, but just make sure that you're not letting your documentation go stale. Next slide, please. The third pitfall uh, is, is not conducting any pre-assessments. And it, maybe we wanna spend a, a second or two to talk about when and where pre-assessments or, or readiness assessments add, add value. Andy from Sentinel Blue made a great point at the beginning of today's event that you know there are a lot of situations where bringing in an assessor or having a gap assessment done makes no sense or adds no value and it's just generally a waste of money. And uh, I'm I'll be the first to tell you that that's absolutely true, even as an assessor myself. Uh, you know, if you're a, a really really small company in in the dib and you haven't started a compliance effort yet, it really makes no sense to have a gap assessment done because your list of gaps is going to be the 800-171 framework effectively. So an assessor is basically just going to copy paste, turn it around and say, hey, here's your 110 gaps against 171, or you know, here's the CMMC level three framework. These are your gaps. Uh, so you, know, you wouldn't hire a penetration tester before you put any security in place. You know, likewise, a, a, I think having a gap assessment done before you started to make significant progress doesn't make uh, much sense. Uh, there, you know, in, in situations where maybe you are this small company and you're starting on your path, I think maybe, you know, and, and we see this a fair bit, we get called for gap assessments when really they're looking for almost mentorship or expertise or guidance. And in some cases, maybe an assessor's a fit, but, um, most often, uh, maybe you want to bring in a managed service provider who can help you not only with the interpreting the requirements, but also on the implementation and configuration side of things. I think the use of an assessor is is often best suited, you know, maybe halfway, three quarters of the way through a compliance program where you've, you know, you've made some assumptions, you've made some technical configurations, some implementations, and now you want to sort of test your 
understanding and interpretation of where things go, but you're not too far along that you've maybe invested significant capital in areas that you didn't need to. Uh, so I think that's really where it, it can, uh, you know, it can add some value. I had uh, in the early days of, of 171, I had a conversation with a small business whose sole IT person interpreted 3.13.13, which is control and monitor the use of mobile code, to mean controls needed to be applied over Android and iOS development. Uh, now, it's easy for those of us who live and breathe this stuff every day to sort of chuckle at that. Yeah, but this was very early on uh, in, in 800 171. And this person's full time job was just keeping systems up and running and keeping the users happy in his free time. You know, he was struggling with these requirements and, and having all this uh, kind of you know, thrust upon him. So, um, you know, I, I, I say that because the the requirements are are subjective and, and can be up to interpretation. So it's, I think, helpful to bring in uh, some folks who um, have seen the, this process bear out and potentially have have helped folks through DIBCAC audits and have seen, you know, what what it is exactly that, that DIBCAC would be looking for. Next slide, please. So, you know, the mobile code example is, is kind of a silly one, but it's one that stuck with me, you know, four years later. Uh, but there are other situations that are very subjective. Um, another one that trips people up is multi-factor. The, the sort of the who, what, and where aspect of it, uh, where you've implemented it, uh, who is impacted by it, who's forced for that second factor, where sort of where in the chain of authentication is it put in place. Um, another one that I don't know that there's consensus on, and we certainly have a perspective, is where you're using FIPS validated cryptography. I think if you asked Maybe uh, if you ask 10 people in the in, in our discord, you'd probably get 15 opinions on where you need it. You know, is it is it everywhere in your network? Is it just once in the chain? Uh, you know, so um, there's some, I think, subjectivity there. Uh, so I think I'd like to leave you with this, you know, consider bringing in a team to review and assess your compliance program. If if you're sufficiently far enough where there's something to review. Uh, if you need to get a basic assessment on file with uh, SPRS, you know, consider uh, having them score you using the DIBCAC methodology. You know, that's you get your assessment done, you get your score, so you can sort of satisfy two objectives, and that becomes your first numerical baseline that that you can use to uh, to track your improvement going forward. That is it from me. I will kick it back to you, Tim. Thank you all. All right, thank you very much, Nick. Um, at this time, we're going to take one final 10 minute break. Um, it is 318 now, uh, so we'll come back in 10 minutes. And um, one other thing to add to as well, there is a QA and a um, coming up here shortly. Um, after Wayne from the CMMC AB presents, we'll do a QA. and a There is a QA. and a um, area in WebEx that you can ask any questions you want, and we will try to get through as many of them as we can uh, before we wrap things up. So we'll be back at uh, 328.